I think everyone accepts that ballasting track is a real pain. But here is how I do it at Chadwick Model Railway. Hi, welcome back to Chadwick Model Railway. I'm Charlie. Ballast is an integral part of your model railway. If it looks good, then people don't notice it. And if it looks awful, everyone notices. It's just one of those things really. So in this video, I'll show you how I do it. And by the way, please don't forget to subscribe. Subscribing is free. I had a little bit of a exchange with someone who thought that he had to pay. Subscribing is free and it allows you uh, access to, to dozens and dozens of other decent YouTube channels, not only Model Railway, but loads of other things. Anyway, ballasting, let's go. Now, people who are more familiar with this channel will realise that all of my track is laid on Woodland Scenic Foam Track Bed, and that's five millimetres thick. And the reason I've done that is because I'm trying to reduce the sound of rumbling trains going into baseboards. The very first Chadwick I built had a terrible effect with the drumming noise caused by these baseboards. You know, it, it acts as the skin of a drum. So, at our model railway club, we have a tail chasing layout that's more of a, what do you call it, a scenic test track, really. It's four tracks are just go trundling around. But where you come off the rear fiddle yard and you go into the first scenic board where it becomes ballasted, the noise changes considerably. But there's cork laid throughout, but it's as soon as the train or the locos hit the board brake and go onto the ballasted section, you can hear the difference. Now that difference will also have an effect here because once I've used this wonderful track bed to reduce the noise, once I bridge the track bed to the board with a rock hard ballast, it's going to induce the noise back into the baseboards. Now on the viaduct, I tried using a watered down copy, tech, copy dex, so it's a rubberized glue, but it had, it was very, very stringy and I don't really want to try it on this, but if you know of a decent rubberized glue, perhaps you use it for your ballast, then please leave it in the comment section below because what I'm going to do today is more of a trial. I'm only going to trial it on this section as it runs down uh, towards the helix on these two lines. So what's my cunning plan? Now in my really right box storing uh, storage containers of which I appear to have a fetish because I've got so many of the wretched things, I line them or at least on the top or whatever with these two millimetre thick foam sheets with a size A3 from Hobbycraft. So what I thought I would do, as this is two mil thick and this track bed is five, I thought what I would do is with a pair of scissors cut this up and then use a rubberized glue um, to glue it in, in place both inside, outside and down the centre of the tracks. This is clearly a straightforward process and these uh, sheets of foam are cheap and cheerful rather than spending oodles of time on a well-known auction site trying to find some similar stuff. And what I'm using for this is Woodland Scenic's own foam track glue and the product number is ST1444. Now, many years ago, my eldest daughter bought me this Hornby GWR signal box and a fine little resin model it is. And I didn't really know what to do with it, but things have changed. Because now I can use this signal box either in its, if the form it is now, or I could turn it into a derelict box. Um, it'd obviously be heavily weathered down anyway. Pop it in there. See what that kind of looks like there. And when originally built, obviously the signalman then would have visibility of the viaduct, of these points, and the points that go up in towards the branch station. So it would be an ideal place for a signal box. So 
so that's the blue foam down um, and all is well. I've also extended it somewhat up towards the branch station. So um, yeah, it's looking pretty good. I put a bit of cork in here just to make it a better foundation really for when I do something agricultural, let's say in here, whether it be fences and trees and all that. But I next need to paint it just to get rid of this awful blue color. And for this, I'm using a ready mix paint from Hobbycraft and nothing special. None of these tubes of umber stuff and everything else. This is 99 pence a pop. So it's just to give it um, an under color as it were, because obviously you've got this um, white sculptor mold um, and we need to get rid of the harshness of that. So I'm just going to put a coat of paint over, over the white sculptor mold and of course the blue of the um, foam track blade. So here we go. I say 99p. Can't be, uh, can't knock it really, can you? So all I'll do is whap some of this on and then let it dry overnight and see if it needs another coat. <laughs> That'll be the phone then. Hiya. Oh, I've forgot what time you said you wanted to come back for tea. Half past. Half past five? Yeah. That was my wife wanting to know what time I want tough supper. <laughs> Couldn't make it up, could you? Anyway, so we'll stick a, a coat of this on. And the reason, of course, for doing this is that whilst it will all be covered in green foliage or ballast or whatever, if it chips off, you're not going to see the white of this sculptor mould or perhaps the blue of the Hobbycraft foam. So it's just a little precaution really to give it a, a foundation colour. So we'll see how it looks in the morning. Well, I've given it two coats of paint and we're all good to go. The, the white's disappeared and the, the blueness of the, the foam is sort of much more subtle. But what, before I go any further, what I thought I would do is run a passenger train from the Helix along this line and record the sound it makes with the sound loco with the sound switched off, obviously. Uh, and uh, just so we can do a before and after to see the difference of when it's ballasted. So what I've done is I've popped my lapel mic right on the uh, on the down line so we can get a, an appreciation of how uh, how it sounds So that should give us a good baseline to compare the before and after ballasting just to see if I'm wasting my time. Now, where do we go from here? Well, just looking back a second, I've already filled in the missing gaps on the sleepers, you know, where you use flexi tracks. So I've got rid of all that. And I also sprayed a sleeper grime type paint um, over all this track to give it that kind of, we'll take away the shine from the sleepers. So the next bit I see is Break, it breaks down to three phases, really. There's the pre-ballasting, the ballasting, and the post-ballasting. You don't have to write this down, do you? Right, so what should we do on the pre you have to do before you ballast? Well, if you're into concrete, concrete trunking, can't get your head around that, um, or your point rodding, perhaps, these are the sort of things you might need to consider before you start laying ballast. For me, I'm, I'm not going to do the point rodding and those cables for semaphore signals. I'm a, a light signal kind of bloke. So I'm going to run the um, Wills kits. This is obviously owned by Pico and it's the SS87 concrete trunking. And I'm going to run this up the, the inside edges of both um, this retaining wall here going up towards the branch station and also along this retaining wall here going down towards the helix. Now a couple of weeks ago when I did these walls I got out my <laughs> my ancient Black & Decker heat gun and you'll be pleased to know here is the little beastie it's um, an interesting thing it's it's quite old but if you apply it to the concrete trunking it softens it and you can bend it so rather than sort of going in straight lines around this uh, curve it will look quite natural now concrete trunking is a strange old thing because 
If you go on the internet and look for various images, you can see that it's um, almost buried in uh, ballast, and that's because the railways have been reballasted time and time again, and obviously nobody's bringing the trunking up. You can find it in more recent times where all the lids have been removed. Back in the late 60s, early 70s, this wasn't the case actually, it was in reasonable condition then because um, lighting or illuminated signals was not relatively new, um, but it certainly uh, wasn't old as it is today. So um, in those days the concrete trunking was in better condition. So you need to sort out how much ballast you want to put up to how low you want your concrete trunking to appear. And also the, the grass can grow both sides of your concrete trunking. Concrete trunking, <laughs> can I get that out? Um, so we just need to plan around it and sort it out. So concrete trunking needs to go in and obviously the concrete trunking, the cables feed something down there. Well they obviously feed your point motors with a, your dummy point motors and also your AWS sensors will go in after you've done your ballasting. But perhaps the platforms for the relay boxes might go in before. Now you can do a lot of research on relay boxes uh, as I've done it and there is it's a complete minefield really they just stick them where they sort of fancy clearly you're going to have a relay box or two or three um, near signals and point motors because that's what they kind of do um, but some are large boxes you might get two large boxes together they might be on stilts they might be ball mounted or whatever um, it's just a case of doing some research thinking what looks right for you and cracking on with it really so let's put this concrete trunking in uh, one stage at a time and we'll crack on and see how we get on. So now it's a case of just doing a little bit of planning. And what I've done is I've got a few of these sections and I've glued them together um, on a cutting mat so you've got the grid to keep them straight with ordinary polystyrene cement. And then I've popped the signal here. This signal isn't going here. I've, I'm, uh, I've got to order the correct one from Matter Absolute Aspects, but it's going to have the same fitting, I imagine, as this one here. So this is just a placeholder, and that little bit of sort of concrete plinth is where it's going to sit. And as you can see now, I've just added a little bit more cable trunking. Um, this is two layers of one and a half mil plastic card that I've just popped in there and those two relay boxes seem to sit okay. And then there's a junction here because I've got some cables to come out of there into the point motor here. And then moving along a little further, the same happens here. Um, with this one, what I intend to do is run uh, cables across these tracks and traditionally on the railways, you'll always find the use of orange wire. And all I use is an offcut of, um, of 702 to replicate the cables that run under the rails and I'll fit these prior to ballasting. And if I thread the cable through underneath the track work, and I'm sure you've all seen these, these things in, in situ, um, so this will come down to there and then another couple of relay boxes in this area to work this double slip and the other points along this side. So there'll be um, some uh, relay boxes and then cable trunking here, just moving up on the other side. It's worth a mention where I've uh, acquired these relay boxes from. Well, uh, they're pretty much all from the Pico sort of wills range. There's these, the SS85 relay boxes set one, and also the SS88 relay boxes set two, you'll be surprised to know. But there's loads of manufacturers out there. Nifty little kits, obviously um, put them together and then paint them, weather them down a little bit and pop them into situ. Um, next thing is obviously to glue my um, cable trunking in. And I can't use a hot glue gun this time, so I'm going to use Copydex, which is a rubbery glue. And in accordance with the instructions, you need to coat both surfaces, both the foam and the underside of the cable trunking. Leave it for 15 to 20 minutes to go tacky and then press it into place. So now it's just a case of painting it on. I'm trying to leave a small gap between the copy decks and the wall so that I can get some, uh, some weeds in and stuff in behind it to give it a little bit of 
depth. Whilst the copy decks is not a permanent solution, I mean you can always pull the uh, pull the cable trunking off once it's dried because it is just a, a soft rubber glue. Of course it will be held in place once I've ballasted. And hopefully I'm not uh, hiding that too much from you. Okay, and then uh, the underside of the cable trunking, very similar, just paint some on there. And then come back in 15 minutes time when it should be tacky and almost dry and then push it into position. There we go. Of course, what we do need to do prior to ballasting is pop a coat of paint over it to sort of make it look like a, a dirty sort of concrete wash. Now, while we're waiting for that to dry, I thought I'd have a chat about ballast. I used to use med uh, Woodland Scenics medium grey blend, but I've moved away from that and I've gone to fine. And the reason is when you look at a layout that's made of the medium uh, ballast, it, it looks too chunky, you know, to scale wise. These are large pieces of rock rather than small nuggets of rock. So whilst some people say that the fine grade is for end gauge, I don't believe it is. It's up to you, isn't it? If it looks right, then perhaps you should use it. Anyway, this is what I'm going to use. Um, but then if you use the medium, the area known as the cess, which is I think spelled C-E-S-S, -S, down the sides of the track usually has a much finer gravel on it. So if you're using medium ballast, then the cess would you do it in fine. But I'm doing it in fine, so I've got no finer to make the cess. So what I thought I would do, um, this is medium grey blend, fine, and this is fine light grey. So hopefully you can see that there's a, a colour difference between the two, which hopefully should um, allow a bit of contrast and a bit more realism once, once the ballasting is done. So we'll try that and give it a go. Now on the subject of ballast, a chap called John Bridget noticed me using one of his um, manufactured ballast spreaders and it's a nifty little bit of kit. I, I, I like using this. But John, being the wise guy that he is, he thought he'd send me another two for me to trial. One of them's O-Gage, which I'll pass on to the West Camel Model Railway Club, see what they think of it. And whilst I use his revised um, double O gauge spreader and see how it copes with the fine ballast. So in a bit, we'll load it up and give it a go. Thank you, John. And if you're interested in one of these, then I shall leave a link in the show more tab down below. Now I mentioned earlier about painting the trunking. So what I'm using is, this is part of the Earth's Col Earth Colors range from Woodland Scenics. Uh, liquid pigment and it's C1217 concrete. So what I thought I would do is just uh, paint a coat over there and then perhaps have a little look with a, a black wash after that and see what it comes up like. And all I do with these is I use a flat brush and then paint from a palette. Um, so I'm trying to minimise the risk, if you like, of me painting the wall behind. So let's put down a little bit of ballast and see how it goes. And here's John's new dispenser and at the bottom of it there's a door. So that's it closed and that's it open. And the way you use it is with the door closed you load the hopper, pop it where you want it to go. And the way I've always done it is you push that and open the door. That allows the ballast to flow and then pulling backwards you leave a trail of ballast. And depending on how fast you move the hopper depends on how much uh, ballast is spread. That sounds a lot easier than it really is. So let's give it a go. First thing is, is to load the ballast. So this might not be the best idea in the world. Yeah, it's going in there okay. Okay, I don't want to overload it. We'll see how much we get in and see what happens. Like I say, it's a, it's a test. So there we are. So all I'm going to do now is I push it open and there it goes and as I pull it back down comes the ballast. And John, this looks like a nice little contraption. 
and there it is empty. Now, I've always found with these things there's a magic trick and it's a spoon because when you beat this with a spoon, the ballast tends to come off of the sleepers. And all I need to do is just to move some of this ballast from the centre. There's a little bit too much in there. Move that out of the way, give it another tap. Lovely. Now, I can't conf I must confess, I now normally use a vacuum cleaner and suck off the middle uh, excess ballast. But I should just continue with this up to that, oops, up to that other point um, with this little dispenser. And off we go again. Oh, we've got a little hole here, have we? Oh, I spotted Charlie. Um, and there we go, right. Bash it, give it a bit, bash. There's a hole there where my droppers are. So after a little bit of manipulating with a spoon, I now need to remove this uh, excess ballast from the center without throwing it away. So in comes my mini vacuum. Excuse the noise. As you and as you can see, it cleans it up pretty well. And of course, the beautiful thing is, the ballast that it sucks up is in the vacuum cleaner, ready for reuse. A little bit more over here. And hopefully you can see that it does a pretty spiffing job. So all I need to do now is just with a fine brush, is just to brush the last few bits off the sleeper tops and then um, start thinking about gluing. Now I use a size 12 flat brush here and just to run this along the sleeper tops as well uh, for some of that uh, ballast that doesn't seem to want to shift. Um, because it will make some of it go down between the sleepers before I finally thrash it to death with a spoon again and then hoover off the remaining bits and bobs. The thing is, every, every speck you leave on there um, will be on there when it's hard and glued. But at the end of the day, you don't have to take any of it off. You know, we can show you examples of a uh, track that's absolutely obliterated with ballast, but I think it always looks a little bit better if you can remove as much as possible. And you can see the advantage now of using that brush. Most of that has disappeared. I've also filled in some of the gaps up to the um, cable trunking, so that looks a lot better now. Um, so uh, yeah, things are, are cracking on. Well, it's time to admit a schoolboy error in as much as I'd forgot to put on the wash on the concrete trunking prior to the ballasting. Now, what I intend to use here was this Trax wash. It's an enamel wash from Ammo MIG, and I quite like it, really, um, you know, rather than the normal Humbrol stuff. And what I'm using is a flat brush size number eight, cheap and cheerful, from Hobbycraft. So all I'm going to do is a, is a bit of a sort of a... Uh, dry brushing technique, but uh, not as light as you might think. And all I do is brush this across the, um, the, the tops of the cable trunking. And uh, as it goes on, it, it seems to go on quite heavy, but being an enamel paint, it doesn't dry obviously as fast as a normal acrylic would. 
Now we can't help but pick up the oops, a bit too much there. Um, I can't help but pick up the odd uh, chunk of ballast as I'm doing this, but hey, hey, it'll just wipe off anyway, so it's no big shakes. So just a case of painting the tops and then moving on to the sides and get those done as well. And then once the sides are done, it's just a case of getting a bit of the old blue tissue and then start and try rubbing it off. Um, it, it's a bit of a struggle to get it off, but at the end of the day, when, once it comes off, I end up with the staining that I'm after. And it's just about uh, the right colour, what I perceive it to be as weathered concrete. So it was a bit of a mistake, but hey, we got there in the end. Now clearly a ballast spreader isn't going to run through these tracks because of obviously the intricacies of point work. But all I do is just open up the, the drawer again and just run it through. And my intentions are to ballast up to here on both tracks um, and then another couple of tracks and then we'll get on with some gluing. And of course it is gluing point work that seems to be the thing that puts fear into the hearts of modellers. So we'll open this up and see how it just goes as usual. And similarly to how I did this, it just be a case of a brush and a tap and to get it to run between the rails. Okay, here's a serious bit. It will take you around about at least half an hour to an hour to apply the ballast and get it into a situation where you can safely apply glue. Now, the ballast is, is down. There's a bit of a, a bung here because I put a blob of glue in there to stop the ballast seeping through and I'm gonna to have to scrape that off later. But the vital point is, is the blades, the switch blades against the stock rails have to be clear. Now, I use tortoise point motors and if I move this across, it moves freely. This stub end needs this gap to go into, so that's got to be clear of ballast. And I will put, put, put no glue whatsoever between that sleeper and that sleeper. And there's a gap there where the ballast has just fallen through, which is great because this has to move. I can't, you can't risk gluing this up. If you glue it up, that's not the end of the world, of course, because you can apply water and um, it will um, dissolve the, the PVA glue. So uh, tread very, very carefully. The other things is to make sure um, that in the gaps between the rails, there is no ballast whatsoever. And furthermore, back here, uh, between these rails here, there must be none. And of course, within the lines of the frog, if there's the odd piece of ballast in there, it's not the end of the world because you can always pick it out um, with a scalpel or instrument screwdriver later. This is the crucial end. You really don't want to glue up um, this piece of plastic, the, the plastic in this area, um, and then be unable to shift it. Because the last thing you want to do is to rip this point out and start again. I have glued points up in the past and I've always been able to free them. It's not the end of the world. You just got to tread a bit carefully. Now applying ballast, I tend to use a dropper bottle, uh, um, a pipette and put the ballast down there, uh, the glue down there. And it's a 50-50 mix with water and PVA, any PVA will do. You know, you can use the cheap cheerful or the expensive stuff. It all seems to work the same. Um, and in this area here, I apply it with a paintbrush rather than the pipette. I don't want it to flood in. I want to be very careful on the amount of glue I add in this area. So this point is ready to go. So I'm going to glue now between about here and here, and it should be pretty much good to go, as I always say. Um, the cables I put through here, you can see the orange and the black cables. Obviously, you have to feed those in before you do your ballasting, and it has a little bit of sort of realism. It's just another little detail that's quite useful. Obviously, this area here isn't done yet, uh, so I'll tidy this up and then come back to you with some glue. So what do we do and how do we do it? Well, the first thing you need to do is spray it with either a water mix with a couple of drops of uh, washing up liquid or use isopropyl alcohol, which I'm going to use. Um, this isn't free, obviously. Oh, sorry, 99% isopropyl alcohol. 
Um, this isn't free, but the reason I'm using it is it'll evaporate quicker and I want to get this video done and dusted and I don't need to wait sort of four or five days for this um, ballast to dry out thoroughly. So with this, it will naturally dry out quicker. And there is a couple of drops of washing up liquid in here in the IPA. Now, when you choose your container, um, watch the spray nozzle because the last thing you want is a jet coming out of here and blasting your, your ballast all over the place so that you're back to square one. And once you start wetting the ballast, you know, you don't really want to get your hands in there at all. So get a spray, mo a spray bottle which has a fine mist to it. Okay, so after we've dampened it down, what do we do next? Well, then you need your, to apply your glue. And this is a 50-50 mix of, of uh, cheap um, PVA and water with another couple of drops of um, washing up liquid in. And the PVA I've used, this is just, just cheap and cheerful. This is the stuff from B&Q made by Dial, their trade brand. Get a spoon, whisk it up and make sure it's thoroughly mixed before you start because the last thing you want to do is, um, is put it on when it's not mixed properly. Don't use old PVA that you found in the bottom of the garage that might be frost damaged or whatever and it's all lumpy and you want to put it through a, a tea strainer to get the, forget it, just chuck it and, and get some fresh stuff. It is lifed, there's usually a use before date, <laughs> so I'm going to drink it, either. Um, on PVA, there is a best before date. So there we go. Uh, how do I put the glue on? I use a pipette. Pipettes are so, so cheap. You can buy these, you know, for literally pence from any model shop or order, order them online. And if you're going to order some, order 20, order 50 or whatever. They are extremely cheap. And you don't really want to start washing them out and cleaning them because you spend more on your heating bill making the hot water to clean them than, than they're actually worth. These are so cheap. A lot of people use um, uh, syringes, but I've... <laughs> In the past, I've got that wrong and suddenly you press the syringe and it all comes gushing out and moves the ballast. So I find it very controllable using a pipette. So what I shall do now is I shall dampen it all down with the uh, IPA mix with uh, a little a couple of drops of washing up liquid. I shall dampen it down and then we'll start with the glue. Wish me luck, fellas. So we're coming in now with the, uh, with the IPA and hopefully you can see it hitting the tracks and we're giving it a fair old soaking perhaps but note the mist on the uh, on this bottle it is very fine and now we here we come with the glue let's put that where I can't knock the thing over Just want to see how how liquidy it is, if that makes sense. Yep, that should be fine. Right. Now I said, but this is the error we avoid. So all I'm going to do is do a little bit of a trial. So I start at the back here with that uh, with the ballast that I'm using against the wall, just to see how that goes. And you can see it's dribbling in just fine. If there's anything valuable underneath these boards, and you might be a hole, use some old towels. Um, you know, if you've got a fiddle yard underneath, so use some old towels to to protect whatever you might have. Like I say, valuable that's underneath. Okay, happy the way this is running. So let's get stuck into the point. So where should we start? Let's start about here and work our way out. And hopefully this should flood through the ballast. If you disturb any of the ballast, leave it. Don't put your fingers on it and start fiddling around. That's the last thing you need to do, really, because it will go all clumpy. Now, getting glue on the actual undersides of these switch blades is pretty unavoidable in some ways. Um, 
but it's a case of going back and checking it out. Right, I mentioned about those blades. So all I'm going to do is paint in some glue. Whoops, a <laughs> big blob fell off. And into here. And that's as close as I really want to get into there. So I hope that all makes sense. Right, I shall progress up the line with the rest of the point work, uh, with the rest of the track work. Now I do understand that there's bound to be people watching this that say, I wouldn't have done it like that, I would have done it this way. And fair play, you know, there are, oh, there's a thousand and one ways of doing all these, um, these evolutions. And I'm not necessarily saying that mine's right. It's just the way I do it and it, you know, it seems to work for me. So there we are and the outside air temperature is around about 22 degrees today. And if the weather stays like this, this will dry out in a day or two. I thought I'd also film a sequence um, of a straight piece of track just to show you um, what it can do in a straight line. And off we go and you can see it dispenses reasonably quickly and reasonably evenly and all I do is just top the hopper up when it runs out it's funny isn't it the hoppers are never quite big enough and then open it up and we go again and I think that is by far an easier way of doing things and then as I've done in the past I just tap it to get the ballast off the uh, the shoulders a bit. And there's obviously a bit of excess ballast in the centre and with my trusty little vacuum cleaner um, if you can see how much there is there now and then if I go the other the opposite way it might make more sense. <laughs> And you can see how easily it cleans up on the inside. Then all I need to do now is just pad out the outsides and I'll do that with a, with a spoon. But hopefully you can see how much easier it is to use one of these simple little tools to lay ballast. Well this one metre section is now ready for gluing but before I do that I thought I'd have a go at putting in a cess. Now I mentioned it earlier that it sits about six foot back from the main lines and is a much more of a um, smaller sort of gravel really but because I can't go smaller than this fine ballast what I'm going to use is Woodland Scenics uh, fine light grey B74 but how I'm going to put it on is a bit of a strange one so what I thought I would do is I decant it some of it into this bag cut the corner off and see if I can just sort of tease it out so we'll see how we get on with that it must be an easier way than this Uh. Well, it certainly looks a little lighter, but whether that's the effect that I was after in the first place is a little bit um, subjective, really, isn't it? Of course, then I go and mess up the rest of it. No, I don't think I'm going to do that. I think if I need to highlight the cess in a different colour, I would choose to use an air gun, an airbrush with a lighter shade of grey um, and, and see how we get on from there. So exactly the same method as before then. I've got the um, spray with the isopropyl alcohol in it. 
I'm going to give it a little bit more of a spraying this time. I think the last section, um, perhaps I didn't put quite enough on. It did take a while to drain through, which is either um, either there's too much, it's just too thick, or of course the surface tension wasn't broken enough. So hopefully this time um, should be better. Well, this is running much better this time. So um, I think it was a, a case of that mix was a little too, what should we say, strong. A double track section, a metre long, I think is enough for anyone. It really isn't the most enjoyable task in the world, this is it. Let's be perfectly honest here. It's tedious. Even with the advantage of using a, a, a baluster, um, you know, you could uh, think of better things to do. What if you could hire someone in, rent a baluster, don't call me, I'll call you, okay? Well, these are the last points I'm going to ballast, and it consists of the uh, viaduct junction, which is two right-hand long points and a diamond. But make no bones about it, to try to keep the gullies of these points clear of ballast when you're po poking it in place is very, very difficult, especially on the diamond crossing, because the ballast clings into all these sections and of course once you ballast it and glued and, and the, the bits are in there it's no big shakes really to pick them out but you just want to try and do your best you can. It's, it's 20 to 7 in the evening now so I'm about to glue these and I shall come back at about well before I go before I turn in just to give the points a flick around to make sure they're not um, gl gluing up as it were and if they glue then I'm sure that I'll be able to free these in the morning. There are a couple of white specks here and what it is it's filler where I've used to fill the holes of the droppers going down but um, a little bit of track dirt will soon sort that out. Right let's finish this off. Well, there we are the glue's on so we'll uh, keep our fingers crossed and see how it looks in the morning. Well, it's now a quarter to 11 the following day and to the touch, the ballast feels dry. Um, I have given it the odd poke and a prod and it is still a little bit soft in places. Um, but using the isopropyl alcohol rather than water has allowed it to dry out so much quicker. Um, of course, it is around about 20 degrees. It is uh, sort of summer in the UK, so it uh, it's not like it's winter time and I'm in an attic, so it is going to dry out somewhat quicker. Um, but using the IPA, yes, you are going to get a faster result, but of course IPA costs money. Looking at it um, closely, there are a few little sort of humps and bumps where I hadn't quite smoothed it out properly. Um, and then next week, when this is completely bone dry, I will pick a few of those bits off as, and, and the, um, some of the uh, ballast that's on, on top of the sleepers. Moving on towards the points, I find it reassuring that they are both working fine. Um, you may be able to see there's a little bit of uh, ballast in there and it just needs cleaning out, which is no big shakes. Um, but the main thing is they're not sort of glued solid and the same for the one further up there. So it was a, a success as far as the point motors are concerned. The blades are all running freely, which is kind of reassuring really, isn't it? Now on a more serious note, I need to run that class 50, back up that track and see if there's any uh, difference in the sound. So I shall pop my lapel mic down over there and run the train again. Well, I couldn't really hear any discernible dis difference between the pre and the post running of the class 50, 
maybe slightly more metal on metal in the second one, but using the foam to me is a success. I'm not getting that resonating drumming noise through the baseboard, so I'm well pleased with that. Moving on to the ballasting, is it such a pleasant devolution? Not really. I've done one, two, three, about three and a half metres of double track ballasting in a day. It's not been a bundle of laughs, has it really? Um, if you do a, a metre of double track in a, you know, in a morning, it's great, isn't it? Because you come into it fresh and you don't lose your enthusiasm for it. But doing a great deal that I've done, yeah, it can, uh, it can wear you down a little bit. When you finish your ballasting, it's all dry. Don't forget to use a, perhaps a Pico track rubber to take the glue off the top of the rails because that's uh, something I did prior to running the Class 50, something not to forget. Summing up then, what do you need? IPA made it dry so much quicker and if you're in an attic in the middle of winter you really don't want to use water because it would take forever to dry out. So IPA could be a, a bonus and the two tools, the little dispenser, there should be a link in the show more tab to uh, John's eBay page where you may uh, wish to purchase one and I wouldn't be without that little handheld vacuum cleaner because you can empty it out, suck up your ballast reuse the ballast straight back into the container so having one of those is a great asset and if you're interested in that again it's in the show more tab down below or via my amazon shop as usual at the end of the video i would like to thank you because it's you the subscriber that make it all worthwhile um, and the people who donate to the channel that's both the paypal guys and the patron people so thank you all very much indeed if you'd like to become a patron you know where the button is there's the button to subscribe and a video here and here. See you in two weeks. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.